This is a Full and Bloom News Brief. More info at fullandbloom.com. In a recent interview with Rolling Stone magazine, bassist Neil Murray talked about his experience while recording on White Snake's 1987 self-titled album. Joining the band in 1978, Murray played on every White Snake album up until 1989's Slip of the Tongue. A link to the full-length interview can be found in the description on the record label's push to make White Snake a big MTV band. Myself and Ian Pace played with Gary Moore for a couple of albums. I got the chance to rejoin Whitesnake in 1983. At this point, it was still a six-piece band with John Lord, but John Sykes had come in to replace Mickey Moody. But then after a bit of touring into the spring of 1984, John Lord left to reform Deep Purple, and there was an accident with Mel Galley where he couldn't play. And so at that point, we did a video for Slow and Easy, and you only see four people as Whitesnake. A sort of light bulb went on over David's head, thinking, okay, you've got a slim down band. They all look pretty good. It was Cozy Pal, John Sykes, myself, and David. That's how he could see it going forward. It was definitely much more suited for the MTV era and much more suited for what Geffen wanted from the band. But their main focus was David and then John Sykes. Though at that point, he hadn't contributed anything song-wise to the band, so that was a very unknown quantity on why Cozy Powell left Whitesnake. The deal that we were offered was not to Cozy's liking, so he left. And so there's three of us in the band at this point. John and David started writing together, and I was involved in that to some extent and doing demos or whatever, and we were searching for a drummer all throughout the summer of 85, and we finally got Ainsley Dunbar. All the backing tracks were done within six weeks in the fall of 85. After that, I'm on a different continent, and David and John take an absolute eon to do the vocals and all the guitar tracks, and they use all kinds of different studios. It ends up costing an absolute fortune. What happened is we'd be on a wage in virtually all these situations. There wouldn't be any royalties being paid. None of us at that point were earning anything from back albums. When our wages suddenly got stopped in April 86, Ainsley immediately left. I had to find a way to survive when David and John were working away for months and months in the States and I'm back in London. It's really difficult to explain the whole situation, but by the end of the year, because John wanted to be so equal with David, because he pretty much was in terms of songwriting and his contribution to the whole musical style of the album, it was very much down to John. But when it came to the mixing, Geffen didn't want him there and David didn't want him there, but he turned up at the studio and was told to go away. He said, okay, that's it, I'm off, I'm leaving. And now you've just got me and David. Am I in or am I out? I didn't know. And in early 1987, when he started to get a band together to shoot a video, he was like, let's just get a bunch of guys from the LA scene. And after the previous chapter of opening for Quiet Riot on tour in the fall of 1984, David and John were very impressed by Rudy Sarzo and how he was on stage. I didn't feel like I was on totally secure ground as far as my job went, but I wasn't being treated like I was out of the band. From my perspective, I was still a member of Whitesnake in January 1987. But then I started hearing, David has a whole new bunch of people. Amusingly, the power struggle between David and John was such that John had been angling for Tommy Aldridge to be the Whitesnake drummer in the summer of 1985. They had a meeting, and David was so offhand with Tommy that I think he got up and walked out. David just didn't want to do what John was ordering him to do. He wanted to be the boss and not have the guitarist tell him who he's supposed to have in the band. It's just amusing that Tommy joined when David was not happy about it when it was first proposed. Rolling Stone asked, how did you feel when the singles explode and the videos are all over MTV and other people are pretending to play your parts? fairly unhappy. On the one hand, compared to the sound on the early White Snake albums, where the bass is very upfront and I have a lot of freedom to play melodic, moving lines with a sort of Jack Bruce or Andy Frazier influence, on 1987, I'm right in the background. It was out of necessity for what the songs require, but also in the mix. I'm way in the background. I was more annoyed about that. And even though my name is on the back of the album sleeve, people still thought that Rudy played 
played on the album because he's in the videos. And I can't hear the bass anyways, so it's not important. It's a double-edged thing. And then I had to fight, along with Ainsley, to get a not very huge percentage compared to what some people would think was fair from the 1987 album Royalties. That was after millions of costs had been taken off, which I didn't contribute to. It was all incurred by John and David. It was kind of, I'm part of something successful, but I'm not. You can read the entire interview at rollingstone.com. Click the link in the description. Oh, yeah.